In this lecture, we will discuss the pathology of endometrial carcinoma. We have already discussed endometrial hyperplasia in detail and now we will discuss endometrial carcinoma. So there are two major subtypes of endometrial carcinoma. One is endometrioid carcinoma and the other is serous carcinoma. The most common of these is endometrioid carcinoma which is about 80% of the cases of endometrial carcinoma. So remember the word endometrioid carcinoma. So let's start with the discussion. So endometrioid carcinoma as the name implies is called endometrioid because it histologically resembles the normal endometrial glands. That's why we call it as endometrioid. And how does it happen? It results when there is estrogen excess resulting in increased estrogen to progesterone ratio. This increased estrogen causes endometrial hyperplasia. And we discussed that there are two types of endometrial hyperplasia. One is without atypia, other is with atypia. If the hyperplasia is without atypia, it usually has low risk of progression to cancer. But if it is with atypia, then with time it can be converted into the endometrial carcinoma. So basically you can say that endometrioid carcinoma happens when there is estrogen excess. And what causes estrogen excess? As we already discussed in endometrial hyperplasia that the factors are obesity. In obesity there is a lot of adipose tissue. So the adipose tissue converts steroid precursors into the estrogen resulting in estrogen excess. Similarly diabetes and hypertension are usually coexisting with obesity that together is called metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome can increase the risk of estrogen excess and endometrial carcinoma. Another factor is infertility. So why does infertility increases the risk of endometrioid carcinoma? Let me explain. So infertility technically means lack of pregnancies in the reproductive age. Now how does this lack of pregnancies affect the risk of endometrioid carcinoma? So you know whenever there is pregnancy, then in pregnancy a lot of quantity of progesterone is secreted. This progesterone is important for the stabilization of the endometrium. So as a lot of quantity of progesterone is secreted in the pregnancy, this progesterone stabilizes the endometrium. And as the endometrium is stabilized during the pregnancy, so this stabilization results in decrease in accumulation of mutations. Because you know that the most of the mutations occur when the cells are dividing very rapidly. But as the progesterone stabilizes the endometrium, so for a certain period of time, the endometrium is stabilized and the risk of developing mutations is decreased. Now in infertility as there is lack of pregnancy, so no increased quantity of progesterone will be secreted. So the protective effect of progesterone on the endometrium is lost, increasing the risk of endometrial proliferation and endometrioid carcinoma. Another thing that causes estrogen excess is estrogen producing lesions that can be caused by pathological conditions such as polycystic ovarian syndrome or granulosa theca cell tumors or it can be caused by exogenous administration of estrogens without progesterone and this is common in perimenopausal women why it is common in perimenopausal women because in the perimenopausal age the risk of endometrial hyperplasia is greatest as we discussed in the previous video so the endometrioid carcinoma is most common in perimenopausal women and what are the mutations involved in endometrioid carcinoma the mutations involved can either be P10 or DNA mismatch repair genes. These mutations can occur sporadically, but sometimes women are born with one defective allele of these genes, resulting in the syndromes that can increase the risk of endometrial carcinoma. If one of the allele of P10 is mutated, then we call it as Cowden syndrome. And in Lynch syndrome, there are mutations in alleles of DNA mismatch repair gene. So these two syndromes increase the risk of endometrial carcinoma, endometrioid carcinoma specifically. But these mutations can occur without the inheritance as well. So the second type of endometrial carcinoma is serous carcinoma. The first type was endometrioid and the second type is serous. So in serous carcinoma, you will see undifferentiated aggressive tumors of the endometrium. Remember that in endometrioid, the tumor resembles the endometrium but in serous carcinoma the tumor is undifferentiated and does not resemble the endometrium so these tumors are aggressive and in contrast to endometrial hyperplasia which developed due to the endometrial hyperplasia this serous carcinomas develop on the background of endometrial atrophy this endometrial atrophy progresses to SEIC serous endometrial intraepithelial carcinoma through certain mutations 
and then ultimately this precancerous lien of serous endometrial intraepithelial carcinoma results in serous carcinoma. And in contrast to endometrial hyperplasia which usually occurs in perimenopausal age, this endometrial atrophy obviously occurs in postmenopausal women. So the risk of serous carcinoma is greatest in postmenopausal women. You can say that serous carcinoma usually happens at a later age as compared to the endometrioid carcinoma. And we discussed that in endometrioid carcinoma, the mutations that are involved are usually P10 or mutations in DNA mismatch repair genes. But here in CS carcinoma, the mutations in P53 are very common. So these tumors are aggressive. Now let's discuss the morphology in endometrial carcinoma. Firstly, we will discuss the morphology in endometrioid carcinoma. So grossly, you will see thickened endometrium. Why you see thickened endometrium? Because this endometrioid carcinoma occurs on the background of endometrial hyperplasia and due to these cancers you will see exophytic or infiltrative lesions. Secondly the microscopic features for endometrioid carcinoma can be remembered by this keyword endometrioid carcinomas. So the name pretty much reflects its architecture. Endometrioid means resembling endometrium. So you will see glands showing mucinous tubule or squamous differentiation. They can range from grade 1 to grade 3. And carcinoma means invasion of lymphovascular space and invasion of stroma. So you will see glands with endometrial differentiation and features of malignancy that are invasion of stroma or invasion of lymphovascular spaces. The second morphology is about serous carcinomas. In serous carcinomas, the main point is that you will not see endometrial glands. Rather, you will see undifferentiated structures comprising of small tufts and papilla exhibiting cytological atypia. And on immunohistochemistry, you will see positive straining for P53. Why there is positive straining for P53? Because serous carcinomas usually contain mutations in P53. And this, and this mutated P53 proteins can be stained immunohistochemically. The last point is that endometrial carcinomas usually present as postmenopausal bleeding. So you know that after the menopause, the process of menses or bleeding stops, but endometrial carcinomas have a tendency to bleed. So they present as postmenopausal bleeding. So this is about endometrial carcinomas.